Okay, boys and girls, we are in the loser's bracket. Battlefield of Eternity. Game number one in our best of three series between the Bobby Cottage fan club and the Rospier Doll. So essentially, Poland against France. Now, I personally, um, I'm starting to doubt that the red team is really French. I want to see papers. At this point, I need some documentation because I don't believe this anymore. Yesterday, it was already very suspicious that they were always attacking. They weren't running away from fights. They weren't trying to retreat all the time. They actually pushed. They were aggressive. They were looking for battles and they were doing exceptionally well there. And today, they were the first team that was in the lobby and they were in the lobby right on time. That usually smells more like a German team to me, but... I don't know, they claim they are French, I've met some of them, looked French, but something is fishy there. I don't trust this anymore. Something is wrong here. I need papers. Anyways, obviously Banshee Cup qualifier number two. Teams are trying to reach the next round one after another, get more points for the ranking, and then after the six qualifiers are over, we're going to have the top teams head over into the playoffs. There's $2,500 of prize money on the line in the Banshee Cup, and it's all powered by Psykev, a.k.a. Kevin, the Heroes of the Storm Sugar Daddy, and a huge Sylvanas fan, which is also where the Banshee Cup gets its name from. So... But yeah, let's start heading into this. By the way, the map is not Infernal Shrines. I'm just realizing that there is a bit of a problem. It's actually Battlefield of Eternity, as I announced at the beginning. And uh, as a pro streamer, I'm just like fixing it like that. So, Garrosh is the first pick for the franchise. We have them also playing with Nagrom today, by the way. So, Nagrom is playing today. Every single time that I'm now looking at Ixia, I'm immediately thinking if eventually we're going to get his uh, Probius again. If that's going to be a thing. Uh, but at least for now, it's probably going to be a support. If it comes to Tomb of the Spider Queen, there's always the chance that Probius is going to be played again by him. But I think a lot of teams will react accordingly. So one of the things that they are already starting to do is banning out Zarya against him. And uh, <laughs> that's why exactly that. Uh, Garrosh and Zarya. I mean, honestly, boys, that was telegraphed. Now, to be fair, after Garrosh was picked, what exactly are you going to do? You don't have a ban anymore. So either you are picking Zarya for yourself or you just deal with it. So they get Garrosh Zarya on Battlefield of Eternity, Speed Bubble on level 4. But yeah, Ixia is kind of known for it, which is why yesterday in a lot of games people started to ban out Zarya against him. And his Probius on Tomb of the Spider Queen is also kind of known. So yeah, there's a lot that's coming together here for them. Vala getting banned. It's always a little bit sad. I like Vala. Vala games are always fun. Get those stacks going, little mini quests. Always entertaining. So yeah. But okay, final pick now. I gotta say, it's a beautiful day in Spain now. Yesterday it was a bit rainy and uh, normally on Saturdays we're going for our big bike ride in the week where you're normally going for something between 120 and 160 kilometers on a normal Saturday ride. And yesterday we skipped it, or at least I skipped it, because the... Ooh, I'm not going for a ban. Because it rained the day before and the roads were a little bit wet and me no likey. Need no likey wet roads. So I waited a day, which is all that you have to do in Spain. And then the next day, the weather is beautiful again. It's again sunny and uh, everything is dry. So we went out today and boy, is it great today. There are still a couple of wet patches on the roads, but it was beautiful. Pretty much no clouds after an hour or two in the morning. Just sunshine, good weather, nice temperature. It was glorious. We were riding with a couple of friends and it was just fantastic. I, uh, I love that lens here. I absolutely love it here. So, in the meantime, my family is sending me pictures from Germany where everything is just like snowed in. And don't get me wrong, I like it. I like snow, particularly when I'm inside looking through a window and there's like a fire or like an oven or something standing right next to me. Then it is great. For a day, fantastic. But longer than that, if you have to walk through it and you know, then the snow melts away a little bit and gets all dirty and it's like, blech, blech. it's not really snow, and it's not really water, it's just like this like muddy mesh and mush. It's just like, yeah, no, thank you. Jojo and Blaze for the Polish team. Really nice frontline for them, obviously. 
Hanzo to take the Immortal down, and on the other side we're having uh, Li Ming as the main damage, played by Nagrom, interestingly enough. It's actually kind of wild. We have Maka now in a support role, and Nagrom has been playing support a lot, obviously. He's not traditionally a support player necessarily, but in most of the teams where he has been playing, he's either been playing in the tank role or support, and now we have him in a damage dealer position, whereas the last pick for the polls is Medivh, played by Sassibos. With that, we're set. Battlefield of Eternity, everybody. Let's go. Game number one in the best of three. First game of the best of three series here in the loser's bracket of qualifier number two for the Banshee Cup. And on the left, Mark Kotzel with Johanna Bronek on Degat Kane, Balor on Hanzo. We got Akunis on Blaze and Sessabos is playing Mediv in our first game of the day. On the right side of the map, Jean Lassalle with Malfurion. We have Malganir on Garrosh, Virtual is playing Leoric, Ixia on Azaria, and Nagrom with Li Ming. So, we talked about Nagrom already a bit when he was playing in Miami at the offline event. He actually played support for the team and had some insanely clutch saves and really helped to carry them to victory more than once. But traditionally, more so of a tank position for him, and he's been doing uh, that in tons of tournaments. But now here he fills in as a damage dealer, so uh, an absolute multi-talent. And he's instantly getting some nice combos connected with Hanzo, who definitely didn't like that too much. At level 4, things are going to become a bit more interesting as usual, just simply because Zarya is going to have the speed bubble. And that is going to allow Garrosh to simply run into the opponent's team and flip people into the back line. So that should help. Very nice stacking from Medivh, by the way. He is sitting at 10 stacks already. And we're not even at the 1 minute mark. 12. Damn. He is crushing it. 14 stacks before the 1 minute mark has even hit. 15. 16. Damn, he's going for a record here. If he can keep that up... I don't, I don't want to jinx it. I, I talked yesterday about a Medivh player doing really well on stacks and it only resulted in him dying about 10 seconds later. So I really don't want to jinx it, but he is crushing it. Absolutely love this. If he continues like that, he's going to be done before uh, three, four minutes into the game. So, yeah, not too bad. Okay, anyways, with that, big fight. And Zarya might fall and does. Ixir down, first blood. And Sesebos made it out. Hanzo, on the other hand, gets the Nagrom treatment and gets murdered. Nagrom takes aim. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Metis for a moment in a bit of trouble, but he's sitting at 27 stacks. The entire team is pretty... Oh, dude, <laughs> if I was you, I would not do that. I don't know why they just left him there for the experienced globes, but yeah, Sesebos is also able to finally retreat and is like, all right, all right, I'm going to head back for now. I'm still highly interested in getting my next talent here, so let's just not uh, overdo it. There's of course also at the top lane, the one versus one that just continues. We have Leoric going up against Blaze with a Drain Hope, riding the pleb horse here. Yeah. Fully plebbing it up. And Zarya not making a choice. Are we not getting the combo? Are they going to try for uh, something else? That is an interesting talent to hold for Zarya to be honest with you. Garrosh is trying to make a play. So they're trying to steal the camp after the blue team has done most of the work. But Malganir in trouble and he's dead. Malganir is down, was trying to buy some time until Zarya is back, but yeah, that didn't work for him. 30 stacks now for Medivh, he's nearly done with the quest. And there it is. So that was actually a lot. Why hold this and then go for the most common talent in level 4 anyways? Particularly with the garage composition. Maybe just forgot to pick it for some reason. And realized it a bit too late. I think it's probably the most obvious explanation. Anyways, Immortals are up. And get immediately attacked. If I'm an Immortal, I'm actually pissed. Can you imagine being an Immortal and then you're just like spawning every now and then to go for this epic battle with your Arc Nemesis? And then you have just like these puny tiny mortals running around you and just like starting to poke you like some mosquitoes. I would be insanely pissed. When are we finally getting the patch that allows the Immortal to properly fight back? You know, just turn around and just slap one of them with that sword straight into the face. Decapitate Garrosh with a single blow, for example. Swat Li Ming like a fly. That's the real patch that we need. The real, you know, like the real PvE patch. Justice for the Immortals. Could be a hashtag. We could make it a thing. 
Three kills to one. Slowly working towards level seven. Leo activated a straight and is down, but <laughs> Zarya gets saved. There's another flip. Quest is completed. Four minute mark on the point. Nice. Medivh with some sexy plays here. So shout out to Sasa boss. That was pretty good. Damn good, actually. Either way, the Immortal gets defeated and it's the red team that walks away with it. So, bit of an advantage for them now with the first objective traveling down towards the bottom of the map. They can try and take the wall out. Maybe more than that. But Quartz needs to be very careful here as he's still trying to uh, uh, stop the onslaught that is definitely going to come. But anyways, at the bottom of the map, we now have the wall bear. This is actually a little bit awkward because not everybody is here for defense yet. Both teams have a level 7, so the wall is already broken down before the blue team even arrives. The one saving grace is that the immortal didn't have a whole lot of shields to begin with. So that is for sure helping them. But yeah, as is, there is just one move coming after another now for the fort itself. And that is tons of damage. I really thought with such a low shield on the Immortal, they would be able to save the fort. But no, they lose Medivh. Quest complete. Time to feed. So, Medivh is down, and so is the fort. <laughs> and Johanna is getting killed shortly after. The Bobby Cottage fan club, everybody. They had some pretty incredible games also in the winner bracket. It was actually a surprise. The way they dropped into the loser's bracket was really a surprise. They had some fantastic games and I am more than intrigued to see how they will perform in subsequent qualifiers. If they can make it into the playoffs and if so, how far they can go there. With a little bit more practice in, uh, in this, a bit more tournament experience here would be pretty cool. And by the way, there are obviously players that have a lot of tournament experience. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to suggest that they don't have any. You have Ixia over here, you have Nagrom. It's just to name two of them. They're also participating in Heroes Lounge. They're in the, the, in the top division over there. Previously, it was, I believe, 1+. Plus. Now it's just simply 1. They went through a bit of a renaming phase. So these guys have been playing for a while uh, as a team there. But it's still a bit of a different story if you're playing in, you know, tournaments with price money, if you're going regularly up against some of the top teams there. Yes, some of those players also play in the amateur scene just for fun. Still a bit of a different beast. So we'll see what they can do. But I am super happy with the way that they've been playing. They showed some fantastic games. And we'll see if they can improve as the tournaments continue or if this is just the top of where they are. We'll see. But either way, we now have a couple more camps up on the map. Level 10 is kicking in for the fan club. So we have them with yeah, heroic abilities now. And the timing couldn't be better. Just as the Immortal comes in, we get the Twilight Dream. And yeah, I guess the blue team is going to at least attempt to poke from afar to get the shield lowered. But the counter plays are pretty, pretty much there instantaneously to save that immortal. And only Medivh's portal is helping them out. So, there it is. And well, up at the top. <laughs> Fly like an eagle. Medivh is just flying around there. If I had a Medivh on my team, like, I understand why people are not using Medivh's portals. That fucker could portal you anywhere. I mean, just think about it. You always think when that portal pops up right next to you, know that it brings you to safety. What if all of a sudden there's a portal that goes through it and you end up in Medivh sex dungeon? Like, think about that for a second. You can't even go out. There's like no portal there. There's no doors. So he could do anything. You need to really trust that guy. If he's on your team and you've been playing with a guy for a long time, you basically know where he lives. And if he just screws with you, you can go over and slap him around a little bit. That's one thing, but if you play with a random in uh, Quick Match or Storm League, I wouldn't use those portals either. Way too dangerous. Huh? Barlo over here. Is he going to be safe? <laughs> they save him! Alright! Not bad. Medivh just stepping his game up. Me likey. The funny part is that Leoric also made it out. I thought that... I, I, I personally expected Hanzo to die, and afterwards I thought, okay, Leo will definitely um, bite the dust, but not quite. At this point, yeah, that's gonna be another bigger Immortal. Second Immortal now for the fan club. So they have now, uh, what is this, 60% shield? Roughly something like it. 
And they should be, I mean, top side wall has already been taken down. A couple of hit points and the Ford also lost. So, yeah, I think that one's gone too. Which is a bit of a bad trend for Rospi at all. The Polish team is not going to like that too much. You really got to buckle up a little bit. Come on, boys. Well, not like that. They lose Jojo. Blondie is down. She was killed. Liming came in and Bye -bye. took her apart. Now they're trying to go for the next kill. But Malganir, a bit too aggressive. <laughs> it's actually taken out by the tower. So, yeah, bye-bye Garrosh. He's gone. Leo is still fighting against Blaze at the bottom of the map. The two of them are going for the little 1v1. And where are they rotating to? I mean, Garrosh dead is obviously a problem. The issue is that you won't be able to push unless you're willing to go up against the numbers advantage, which most teams are highly uncomfortable with. Now we got 36,000 damage from Liming, 26,000 for Medivh, and Medivh is the top damage dealer for the blue team. I have honestly no idea if at this point I should just simply be impressed by Sessabos, or if I should be disappointed by the rest of them. <laughs> it's, it's one of the two. And Medivh, he had completed his quest four minutes in, which was highly impressive, so I guess we're going to go down the, the imp being impressed part. Jet Propulsion is once again out, and Tomb coming in, Li Ming again looking for damage, Nagrom wants a bit more here, looking for them, resets, and uh, kind of underestimating Hanzo there for a moment, which nearly resulted in Li Ming dying, but another good move from Zarya and Garrosh, and that is the end of Hanzo, Blaze about to fall, Jojo is that, it's a triple baby, three down, and yep, that puts them firmly in the driver's seat at that bot lane, Pressure play that they're executing. Seven kills against four. Level 13 talent advantage. Leo has actually gone into the Spectral Leech. And we're getting the Illusionist for Li Ming as they're poking the wall down. Okay. Well done. But, anyways, up at the top. Now we got Virtual now starting to move in. Also, I thought. But he gets too much company too quickly, and I think that's a deadly Oki. Yeah. <laughs> Casper the Friendly Ghost is back. And Mulganir, I'm not so sure why exactly he is that far out either. He is highly aggressive with his positioning. That already stopped their push at the top, and now he dies. They at least get a counter kill against Mediv. But yeah, Mulganir a bit too far out there. So that's not the moment where you want to fall. If they could have gotten that kill against Medivh and not lose Garrosh, that would have been the dream for them. But they are at least going for Deckard Kane. And the old Giza goes down. Beautiful in Tomb. Blaze following it up quickly with a bunker, but it doesn't change the fact that Johanna is dead again. Akuna is the only one that gets out of the fight now. But of course, it is a disaster. We have Leo pushing the top. We have them go for the Immortal. Ah, <laughs> the entire map is now open to them. So, right now, it looks like the fan club is going to be highly dominant in this series. Might be that the Poles still need a little bit more caffeine. Need to wake up, need to be shaken a bit. And the Frenchies are certainly doing that. So... Not too shabby. Halftime show is coming in. They're also going for their camp. And to make matters worse, they have level 16. So everything is currently going against Ross Piedol. The blue team is for sure struggling. Leo is ghosting around on the left and trying to defend the Immortal at least a little bit. But you can already tell that this is going. Even with the tiny amount of damage that the blue team is now pushing out, the fact remains that the red team, that the fan club, is getting another big shield. And now we're 13 minutes in. So... Yeah, these things are starting to hit a little bit harder now. Also, just to have a quick look over here. 51,000 damage by Nagrom. And, oh my god, this arrow. Woo! That's long distance, baby. Garrosh dead again. Malgany is trying to go for the record here. Yeah, that's the fourth time now that he's fallen. And, well, then we got Jojo also with four deaths. But they are slightly unlucky. Now, the good news is that while they are trying to fight that battle, the Immortal is doing work, and that includes the bottom keep. This is going to get destroyed, 100%. The only ones in this game that haven't fallen yet are Malfurion and Luming, so good on Nagrom in particular. But 
Both keeps have taken damage. This one is gonna get destroyed a hundred percent. And yeah, they try to push the fight past it. We'll see. The one question that has to be answered later is simply if it's the draft, if it's that Garo Zarya combo and Nagromon Li Ming that really works so well for the fan club, or if they are just uh, today superior to the blue team. The shield is still there. 16 is available for the rest of the defense for Rospier Doll, so they are fighting back instantly. We have them now with a holy renewal. Short distance arrow from Hanzo. Nice save. Nagrom alive. Gets a couple more combos out, but they are still going to use some heroes. Leoki dead again, which is not too bad here. The counter kill against Deckard Kane makes this definitely a worthy trade. And they're trying for Hanzo again. Nagrom with a hit. Not even sure if Calamity properly connected there for a second. It seemed like it didn't. But yep, they pushed him back. Draw, dodged the ley line even. Neat! And now they can go for Blaze and take him apart too. Still, they will probably have to back off here. Leo will respawn in 9 seconds, but Melgany is also a bit low. If you're one and a half levels ahead, you're usually well advised to just play it safe, play for level 20, and don't play too aggressive now. But yeah, pretty good. Looking solid, taking now also one camp after another. Particularly down here at the bottom of the map, as you can see. Now, for the blue team to make a comeback, they have to really capitalize on uh, they have to capitalize on that uh, that level 16 talent. They have even talents with the opponent right now, and yeah, it's a bit it's going to be a bit nasty if they can't do that. Because level 20 is going to hit in next, and once you have Storm Talents, I mean, that lead is brutal. If you're already behind and have lost the keep, then this is really the moment to fight. The blue team has to find an opportunity in some kind of positioning that allows them to get a good angle and that fight that battle. If they lose the next Immortal, then it is lights out. Their remaining keep has taken damage. There's just nothing else to do. Use the opportunity, even two levels down, where you have the same talent here as your opponent, and then go for a fight. That's the only thing they can do. The Immortal is already getting destroyed and Hanzo has fought back a bit, but they have to go for the actual team fight. And they're trying to lock down Garish. Okay, Hanzo with an arrow already, but it's another short distance. Here comes very quickly the ley line and they're following it up on it with a nice jet propulsion and a double kill. It's a triple, baby! Nice! They're even going for Leo. That's exactly how you come back into that game. Now at the top, gotta be a bit careful here. So, yeah, that keep is gonna take damage. But look at the follow up. Look at the jet propulsion. Bam! Stun and then Medivh lining them up beautifully. And everybody just going for kill after kill. It's 25 kills now in total. And we have 12 kills to 13. So it's not like the blue team doesn't get any kills. But they usually are not able to do too much with them. Stealing that camp away is definitely a good first step. They also saved their top side keep, but now they need to get the immortal and make a big play here. They gotta, I mean, <laughs> think about it for just a second. If you're looking at the minimap, you'll see that they haven't taken out a single fort yet. So, yeah, that needs to change and it needs to change quickly. The good news is that what they just accomplished with the four kills also uh, brought them back in experience. They're nearly on the same level as the fan club. Well, technically they are on the same level. There's still a gap between the two of them. What I'm trying to say is they will hit level 20 roughly around the same time. There's still a window that has to be gapped somehow. And I think that's the reason why they're not comfortable pushing with the Immortal. But if they're giving up the Immortal and make it an easy defense for the fan club, then they should at least start to push for the bottom fort a bit. Now there is going to be a rotation coming. They need to be aware of that. But some damage at least needs to be done here. And if they're splitting the opponent's forces, it's also going to help them with topside. Nicely done, and Tomb is out, Bunker gets dropped right away, so that they can save the target, particularly with Buried Alive, of course. But, of course, I mean, again, one fort is gonna fall, maybe both of them. This is actually looking very, very good right now. So, yeah, one more hit, and there it is, one fort destroyed, and since at the bottom of the map it looks very similar, we're gonna see them with two forts dropped, thanks to the Immortal that they just won and the experience that they gained. And level 20 should be available in a moment. There it is. Immediately the upgrades are coming. 
for their ult. Can they get the kill? They can. Garrosh is dead. Guys, if they turn this around, that would be insane. The fan? No way. They farm Malganir. And now they're dropping not only Malfurion, but also Leoki again. <laughs> this is not right. This can't be real. Does this remind anybody of the first game that we casted from the fan club? Like seriously, that, does this remind anyone of the first series that we had from the fan club? This is bonkers. How can this happen again? They had it. They pretty much had it. They were already thinking about going for core at some point. And now we're looking at this and it's just like, um, yeah, we're three heroes down. Nice job by Nagrom. That was big. That kill against Blaze was huge. So the keep is defended. Good for them. Now those three are really fighting back. Barlow is going to get out. The ley line plays that we are seeing time and time again for Medivh are pretty big. But it's just bonkers to me that we end up in a situation once more where the fan club might lose the advantage that they've been fighting for the entire game. This is just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So we have 82,000 damage from Liming. Definitely carrying this one hard. And then 71,000 from Hanzo. Now there is of course a bit of an uh, unfortunate situation going on for Ross Pidol because despite the fact that they did really well earlier, they just lost place and he's not back for another 15 seconds. The Immortals are already up on the map. So that essentially means that right now you have to somehow try and deal with this in a 4 versus 5 situation and it's, yeah, it's not going to be easy. To say the least. But okay, with that now, we have the top side still being pressured. There's still a camp that they were able to take. Blaze is back. So we get that. And now they can see if maybe there's a chance to get another quick kill. Mithril Maze not completed yet for Leoric. But yeah, everybody is just like diving around the Immortal and then trying to see if they have maybe a chance of making a big play there. So off we go. More poke from Nagrom against the Immortal essentially. One combo after another. So far so good and it looks like they're going to get it with a massive shield unless the blue team is just going full on YOLO and are trying to win a team fight here. That's the only chance really. If not, if they don't do that and eventually Li Ming is simply going to take it here. So there it goes. Arrow's already out. Bunker has been used. They're trying to drive them back. The ley line hitting three. Can they go for another jet propulsion? They might. There it is. And is it a kill? The bubble from Zarya saves Li Ming. Malfurion with a Twilight Dream. And thanks to the upgrade, he was able to jump away here. The Astral Communion. Jean Lasalle is still alive and kicking. But they are in a choke point right now. This battle isn't over. Once that Blaze is cooled down back, they might be able to go for that stun again. But that Immortal is so low and the fan club is going for it time and time again. And they will get it unless they're really starting to force the issue and it's too late already. That is a mad shield. And Blaze dies. But Garrosh, Garrosh is also killed. Melganir died for the seventh time now. Five deaths on Leoki. Maybe now, Hanzo, can they get him too? A bit of a brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Well, the fan club, they've actually done it. Game number one went to them, and now we're heading into Tomb of the Spider Queen. Their map choice, and I can see... I can feel... A Probius ban in the immediate future. If they're not banning Probius, then Probius is going to get picked. <laughs> I'm predicting this right now. Uh, Ixia would love to play another Probius on Tomb. He's, he's done it yesterday. And I'm very sure that they would love to do that once again. So we'll see if Probius gets banned. And if not, if he actually picks it. But my money would be on him pulling that off. So, yeah. The first bans are Anubarak and... Hogger though. I think teams are going to try and ban heroes out against Malgonir a little bit. They ban Chromie. Probius is currently up. Just saying. Could of course be banned on the third position. But we'll see if Ixir goes for it. I would love it. Probius is... It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, I made fun about Probius since yesterday's game a bit, and I told the story how Probius was introduced in the Nexus and how Blizzard just had completely, like, was completely removed from reality with their expectations of what they thought that hero would offer and how it would be welcomed by the community. But it doesn't change the fact that it would be nice to see some of these underplayed heroes every now and then, you know? You don't want to have them in every single game or anything, but you want to see them occasionally. The same is also true for, like, Gazlo, for Nova and whatnot. It's one of the reasons why we came up with the Meta Madness concept back then in the first place to make sure that that happens now we have a first pick for the polish team they're getting uh, uh, mephisto and if you wanna i mean again if they're really thinking about probius they have to uh, they have to think about two things right now is the opponent really going to ban the probe yes or no if they feel that they do then they have to pick the hero early so uh, if not, then they're just going to wait it out. We go Sylvanas, we go Diablo from Malganir, which means that now the blue team has their double pick and then we're going to go into the ban. So at this point, if Ross Pedol is really worried about that, if they know that this is a power pick for Ixia and that on this map in particular, he might take it, then they should think about banning Probius on the third spot. Could, of course, all be for naught and Ixia is like, yeah, whatever, I'm going to play support here. Don't worry. But... First and foremost, let's see what the strategy of the blue team is. So we get Stukov, Muradin, Stormbolt into a lurking arm. And, yeah, that means we're going to get some bans. Uh, I am currently still searching for Junkrat here. Junkrat is usually a hero that you see on Tomb of the Spider... I mean, on pretty much most maps, but on uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen more so than some others because of how nicely he can interrupt anybody that is trying to get a quick hit in. So that Junkrat has so far not been picked is actually a bit of a surprise to me. Mm. So, let's see. <laughs> yeah, this is a big one. <laughs> what do you ban here? I mean, yeah, Junkrat is also a pretty good uh, choice there, so we'll see. And, well... They ban Anduin! I can relate. Banning Anduin, always a good choice. But that leaves us with a potential Probius pick, so yeah. And we get Anna and Dehaka. They could still swap that over. So, in this case, they're just picking it with uh, Ixia. Uh, but yeah, I think right now the Probios chances now that we get the Haka also in the picture are a little bit smaller. It would have been kind of fun to see it, but okay, maybe they're not busting that out every single time they're on Tomb of the Spider Queen. We'll see what they're going to do here, but also the question of course, what is the blue team going to do? What are we going to get from them? Malta Ale, and we're going to get Tigers. All right, overall, well-rounded draft. I'm still a bit surprised that we didn't get to see Junkrat, but we now have Muradin with good Storm Bolts, follow-up damage from Mephisto, maybe last rights for Malthale to drop on top of that too. And, yeah. Leaves us with the final pick. Jean Lassalle. What are they going for? They could still, of course, swap heroes around if they wanted to. But, yep, there we go.
The last hero to be chosen is Jaina. Bit of burst damage. Second game of the series. We are in the loser's bracket, everybody. Let's go. The Bobby Cottage fan club against the Rospidol. Second game, Rospidol against the fan club. And for the blue team, it's also their last chance to stay in the tournament. If they lose on Tomb of the Spider Queen, then they are kicked out of the second qualifier. And they have to try again next week. For Bobby Cordage, on the other hand, win would go a long way to secure them some additional points. We have Muradin over on the left side, played by Makotstl. We got Akunis playing Malthael, Bronek on Stukov, Mephisto gets played by Sesebos, our Medivh player from last game. If he's, if he's anywhere near as good with Mephisto than he is with uh, Medivh, then yeah, he is going to crush him. Ball on Tychus, and on the right side, the Frenchies with Virtual and the Haka, Malganir on Diablo, Jean Lasalle on Jaina. We get Anna played by Ixia, and Malganir on Diablo. Okay. Big brawl in the middle, get a grenade built from Anna, and on top of that, we're now also looking at Fear the Reaper on level 1, plus Jan Yelling Power for the missile build that we're getting with Mephisto. It's party time, and my eyes are on Sesebos. I haven't seen him in a while, I gotta say. Sesebos has been... May okay, maybe this is just me, and I'm absolutely blanking, and I just didn't notice consciously, but Sesebos has been playing with some of the Polish teams a long time ago, and I haven't seen him all that regularly lately. I don't know if that was because he lost interest playing in some of the tournaments, if he just didn't play for some of the teams, whatever the case, but he's been crushing it with Mediv, and he's only playing today, he hasn't played for them yesterday, at least not that I could tell. Again, might have missed him at some point too. Sometimes it just happens, you know, there's like a player that's always there, but he doesn't make anything that immediately stands out to you and you don't consciously notice it. But I could have I could have sworn that I haven't seen Sazaboss in a while. But his Mediv performance was great. Now, can he do the same with Mephisto? We'll find out. But definitely something that I'm a bit curious about and also sort of want to see what happens in the upcoming qualifiers where they will for sure also participate. So, with... The first couple of plays being made down at the bottom of the map, teams are now starting to get their gems together. We're of course also getting some camps that they're focusing on, Siege Giants in particular are coming to mind right now. And on top of that, in the middle of the map, it's already the first two camps that are going up against each other. So yeah, there's a bit of a party happening right away with level 4 kicking in. Bruiser camps are colliding and everybody is just going through the early game motion hoping to also get a quick and uh, cheeky kill. We have the bigger they are for Tychus, so they're starting to burn down the hit point pool of Diablo whenever they can. And Malganir is trying to bully some of the blue team players down at the bot lane, trying to go for Malthael, but not quite working for him just yet. But those gems are coming together, more so for the blue team, and also, oh ho ho ho, I was about to say first blood, but yeah, not quite, that's close though. So, Siege Giants are finally destroyed. Those bad boys have done a bit of damage here already. So, nice. We're able to get quite a bit done with that gate. Taking a tower down and the gate itself nearly two. Malganir, bit low. Okay. But a nice wall stun from him. Arkunis has to be super careful. And Malthael is therefore moving back. But once that last rise is ready, something like this can't really happen. We now have on level 1 the Soul Shield for Malganir too. So we've seen that a lot more lately, and it resulted in some fantastic survivability for Diablo in multiple games that we've observed. Up towards the mid lane, again, the rotation is still hitting, and it's hitting hard. So, yeah, here comes Makotzel once again. They go for Dibbles, and this time it might be in way too much trouble. Malganir gets out. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, it's so close, and he dies. <laughs> Oh, first blood, Diablo is down, Lord of Terror, my ass, that guy is a weak kitten, that's all he is, but they get the counter kill, that makes more than up for it now, Stukov is gone, but look at Anna, Ixia, might have bitten off a bit more than he can chew, no Stormbolt available in this situation for Muradin though, or oh, that could have been the end of her, yeah, but it's ready to save Malthail I guess. The problem with Malthael is also, he has 20 gems, 30 for uh, Muradin, so yeah, they need to turn in quickly. The only team that has safeguarded some, 
is the French team. Malta, no way. Gets killed at the bottom of the map. Dehaga gets him and that's 20 gems lost. Wow. Yeah, that's unlucky. Okay, it is what it is. Now, of course, the question, what can the blue team do to make up for it? Oh, well, the first thing that they're trying to do is go for Nargrom and take Sylvanas out. That's not going to happen anytime soon. Here comes the Red Web Weavers and the fan club. Last time that they played on Tomb, they might have lost the map, but they looked fantastic throughout the entire series. It's just in a late game where they all of a sudden got crushed by their opponents. So now a big opportunity to use those first Web Weavers and, yeah, just go for it. So we'll see if they can pull that off. For the time being, it's looking like a pretty nasty push with a potential level 10 since they have an entire level lead already. So this is going to help them even further. Let's we'll see if they can do that. But yep, the push at the bottom of the map is already going on. Half a level until level 10. Did I say 20 earlier? I meant 10. So yeah, until rogue abilities. But yeah, this is going to be one fort at least. And they're starting to crush him quickly. There we go. This one is eliminated. Now they're making a move. Oh, for Meriden with 38 gems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. They kind of get way too close for comfort. I mean, I'm sweating and I'm sitting in front of my PC right now. I'm not even playing. I'm just watching this shit. But damn. Level 10 is ready. We get the ring. No water elemental. Oh my god. Apocalypse and ring of frost. ring a ding a ding 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 they, I mean, if they can set it up with the nice, uh, okay, they have nano boost of VSA as well, so there's a lot more damage coming through potentially. If they can set it somehow up with the Apocalypse, that would be fantastic for uh, Jaina. But yeah, time will tell. 69 gems, nice. For the blue team, but they're going to have level 10, they will get it in a moment. And then we can see how far they can go with this. Down to the bottom of the map. Nagrom is already going for the next camp and is trying to do his thing here. So he will take the siege giants for them. As all of this is playing out, we have the bruiser camp already taken. And here comes the last riot. Here comes the uh, Commandeer Odin. And another from the Harker. The court still jumping out. <laughs> he really wants to get rid of his gems. <laughs> 41 at this point. Noteworthy that the blue team has not turned in a single gem yet. Not one. We are seven minutes into the game and they have turned nothing in and they lose Diablo. But Maltel is dead as well. Big shove coming out there. So yeah, kill for a kill. They follow it up with another one against Nagrom, against Sylvanas. Three kills to three and maybe finally a bit of momentum for the blue team. Seems like they might have an opportunity here to turn in, get some web weavers, and finally get a foothold in this game because things have not really gone too well for them. 50 gems from Akotzl, I mean, that's a solo turn in right there, and they get it. So blue web weavers are going to hit the ground, and we'll see what they can do with it. Can they come in, take a couple of forts down, draw even on structures? and get maybe a bit closer to a potential 1-1 situation. If they can follow up with kills, they go for virtual, that's 12 gems, and that's the dead Dehaka. Gems might be recovered, yep, Nakro moves in, but that still means that Ma uh, Dehaka is not going to be here, at least initially, when uh, the defense needs him. In 16 seconds, he can tunnel over, so he's not going to have too much travel time, at least, but obviously that, uh, that push is going to be a lot more successful now. And if Malganir dies too, yep, last rides, bye-bye. Diablo is dead, and that's a second stack also for Malthael. So that is starting to... Wow, Jaina is too? Damn. Jaina's gonna die as well. She got the ice block and delayed it, but she's still gone. And that is just... Yeah. Problematic. <clears throat> because now they can attack every single lane. They basically broke through every wall there was. And now they go for the fort in the middle. This one gets destroyed. Likely not going to be able to do more. But damn, they are murdering them. Like, what's happening here? They're getting kill after kill after kill after kill. Every single time it looks like the red team will be back with five on the map. There's another hero dying. That's a free turn in for the second web weaver wave for Ross Piedol now. They are absolutely snowballing this here. We have on level 13, the Shroud of Wisdom. And, well, 31,000 damage for Tychus. 
top damage dealer for the blue team. 22,000 for Jaina. Teams are both on level 13. There is an advantage for the blue team, but now they're even moving in, trying to start damaging that bottom forward. Will yoloed out by Mephisto, but did not properly connect. But as you can see here, they're still able to do some structural damage to the fort. Don't want to deal with the entire defense. And here come the Web Weavers. Sylvanas is already sitting in the middle, going up against Malthale. They're abandoning the bottom of the map for a moment. They're more interested in trying to go for Nagrom. Yeah, but he is able to jump to the wave and get out the storm ball just too far away to connect. That would have been a glorious kill, though. If you can take those 27 gems away from the red team, you're shutting down all of their chances of getting a turn in any time soon. So the rotation towards the top is happening. The goal being to destroy another fort here and then in closer and closer to this. So, yeah, there it is. This one's gonna get dropped. And they're going for the choke point fight. <laughs> <laughs> in Matsaya sense, no chance. <laughs> Apocalypse, Ring, Blizzard. Yeah, you can't go into a choke point like this with this many AoE abilities on the other team. Muradin is also dead. Thankfully, he turned in earlier. But losing those two frontliners is obviously you not know, helping their cause. Now, the wall at the keep is also going to get destroyed. And the rest of the red team has already taken position around the boss. They're clearly trying to uh, get some worth here. So yeah, the turn-in was actually not too bad. They got the top side forward. They destroyed the wall on the key pretty much completely. At the bottom of the map, they also did some damage onto the fort. And they will, with their siege giant, very likely take that out too while the red team is busy going for the boss. So if they could keep their heroes alive, maybe they would have been able to do a bit more damage up at the top lane. But generally speaking, with the two turn-ins, they took out two forts completely. That wall at the top can make a big difference later if the second boss, for example, is taken at any point. But they still have to push for the bottom fort if they want to get some value here. We now got the Numbing Blast on level 16. This bit of a leading experience again for the fan club. And yeah, so far so good. Defense is ready. Red team could turn in, should turn in, will very likely turn in. And has now Dehaka in position to do exactly that. And so they should. Again, they kind of need to try and pull that off. So yeah, the Haga turns in. That's another Web Weaver wave. 16 will be available for the blue team to defend against it. <laughs> Their top forward is going to get murdered. It's more about what's happening in the middle, I suppose. We have now 30,000 damage for uh, Jaina, so she's starting to catch up with Tychus a bit, who's still the lead damage in the game. And with level 16, interesting. Muradin has actually gone into stone form. Have not seen that in a hot minute. So Muradin with stone form. Lots of survivability for him now. He has the healing static and the level 4 double clap. And now stone form plus third wind. So they're trying to make him as tanky, as survivable as he possibly can be. As the red team is going for another fourth. They dropped the one in the middle. Web Weaver at the top lane should deal with that situation too. But here in the middle, thanks to the camp that is still pushing. And also, the aura. Okay, the aura is gone. They lose the mage. But they should still be able to break through this a bit. Bottom of Beaver has been defeated. They're trying to go for Diablo again for not just a moment. But they gotta fall back right now. So, situation is starting to be a bit better for the fan club. Every single fort is now destroyed. Some walls have been opened up. Middle, bot lane, and at the top. Yeah, not too much here, but again, they were able to take the fort out, and what more do you want at the end of the day? The push with Sylvanas, using her to enhance these pushes, of course, great, but Nakrom also has 40 gems, so you don't want to be too aggressive. And he's already getting a bit low in his mana pool. Apocalypse, okay. They're trying for the kill. Nice, Ring of Frost. Connecting with three, but they are the ones that might be in trouble because they lose Jaina, and Bronek just walked out of the fight, and Nagrom is dead. Nagrom is dead, and that was absolutely not worth it. That was a stupid move. Yes, they got the kills. They got Mephisto, but what does that do for you if you lose 40 gems? That was just silly. You can get the kill, and if it was the other way around and your opponent is holding all of those gems, then by all means go for it. But making that move, being that aggressive, and then losing all the gems in the process... Yeah, that is totally unnecessary. So, was it worth it? Nope. Yeah. Or as some people would say, just in case that I wasn't clear yet.
So, that is, uh, yeah. Questionable choices. Fan club looked great. <laughs> and then that happened. They could have just fallen back. They already did enough damage. They started damaging the keep. They took the walls out. They had a leading experience. They were looking great. And now they are... I don't want to say even. They're pretty even with the, uh, with the blue team. The difference is not that much. So, yeah. I don't know. But yeah, either way, by now we got Virtual at the top getting absolutely ganked. <laughs> The poor guy has no chance getting out of that fight. I mean, absolutely none. And it is the third stack for Maltail. So, three stacks currently. 15 second cooldown reduction. It's really starting to help. And they are starting for Nagrum again. Who's back to 10 stacks. There's obviously also Malganir that they can try and go for, which they're currently attempting to do. Yeah, good damage, good kill. Malganir down, losing his soul stacks. And there's 21 gems that can now be turned in by the blue team. And they can get the full Webweaver turn in. They also have level 20. And with Balor now dropping his 6 gems, this is going to be another wave for Rospiadol. Good for them. So there's the opportunity, as both teams hit level 20, for the blue team to take a keep. They have taken the top wall out. Boss is, by the way, up after this too. So, something that they can uh, try and deal with as well. Always assuming, of course, that they get a kill. Or get a really uh, quick rotation going. Chance of that happening is a little bit slower. You're not going to get your entire opponent down at the bottom of the map. And you are able to go boss on the other side. Like, it is highly unlikely. It would mean that the uh, fan club is pretty much fa uh, brain farting completely. But, well, here comes the push in the middle. They got the camp, and they have the push, and they're immediately popping the big red button. Yeah, they want to the keep. Sylvanas is defending top, though. That Web Weaver is already gone. At the bottom of the map, it's taking the bot lane forward. That one's destroyed already, and is now still pushing. But here in the middle, the defense is not too shabby. The red team is doing well. They're taking down the Web Weavers. Now they have to just stop the rest of the team and also the camp here. If they can keep everybody alive. Malganir survives. And here's the APOC. And the ring. Tigus is dead. And the nano booster. Jaina is starting to crush it. They get a drop on Muradin. They're going for Mephisto. And he... Ah, he's going to get killed by the Haga. <laughs> yes. The Haga takes him out. And they go for Akuna. So Maltel is... Is a dead uh, too. Only Stukov survives. There's still Web Weavers at the bottom of the map, and Sylvanas is now going to start and take care of it. But that's a five versus one on the map, and they're crossing already to go for the bottom keep. So essentially, what's happening now is they are going for core. They are letting the bottom keep fall. They're not defending it because they're saying we are just going to cross map. We're going straight for the core. And, well, first for the keep, then for the core, and end the game right here. Question is, can they? It's 14 seconds until Muradin and Tykes are back. And I am not so sure. I mean, again, the, the core is going to take damage. You're going to be wrong. But the question is, can they really do the entire thing? That might have been a bit too aggressive. And Ixia is dead. So that's the support gone. Yeah, they're not going to be able to do that. Maltel is down, but heroes are now reviving. And that was just uh, way too optimistic. <laughs> So, mistakes were made on both sides. The core hasn't even been scratched. They weren't able to walk... They, they, they weren't even able to work through the shield. Malganir is now dead. So, what they've basically have done... <laughs> it's actually kind of funny. <laughs> what they've done is they killed four heroes. Then they sacrificed their keep, which they could have saved. And instead of, you know, going for turn-in, going for the boss, they're like... YOLO! And it majestically backfired. And now the red team, uh, the blue team is saying like, you know what? We're going to do the same thing. But for us, it's going to work. So yeah, they're going to go for the core now. We're 18 minutes in. And I also don't know if it's going to work for them. I mean, I have the same problem here. 13 seconds until Anna's back. Unless somebody dies right now. Nagrom? Okay, if Nagrom dies, it's a diff Yeah, he's dead. All right, fair enough. If Nagrom was able to survive until Anna is back, a bit of a different story. They could have started to buy some time with some nice sleep darts, for example. 10 seconds for Jaina. This, I think, was defendable. Apocalypse is in. Uh, Diablo gets sacrificed. 
I think you could have defended that. Stalled it out long enough for some more heroes to come back and make a make a play. But of course we're going to gain number three. Ross Piedol, they take victory and tie the series. <laughs> Nicely done. GG. Towers of Doom, game number three. The Polish team. Yeah, the Polish fans are still going strong. It's actually fairly amusing to me. We have some pretty strong communities in Heroes of the Storm, just in general. And I believe that the Polish community in particular is quite loyal and also pretty big. So uh, seeing them cheer for their team is always fun. And again, essentially, we have Poland against France right now. And I don't really know who's gonna take it. It's also... I feel the last game emphasizes again a little bit what I talked about. I believe it was in game number one. That I would like to see the Bobby Cottage fan club participate in more of the games here. Yeah, again, in my opinion, there's simply a difference if you're playing in a tournament with prize money against other teams that are on a bit higher level. Or if you are more so for fun compete in the amateur scene. Even if it is in the highest amateur league. In Division 1, for example, for Heroes Large. There is a difference. And I think with a little bit more experience there, that last call would not have happened. The second that they started to walk towards the core, I was already like, mm, that could work, but it is a risk. And to be fair, it could have worked. It would have been close, I believe. But maybe, you know, they got a chance there. But uh, with the death timers as they were... I would not have been comfortable making that call. So if they just stay there, defend their bottom keep, go for the boss, they're gonna get a much bigger lead, maybe even a turn and can try and end there. In the heat of the moment, on the other hand, when you're in the game, we obviously are just looking at this from a bird's eye view. We have like full vision and everything. But in the heat of the moment, then uh, stuff like that happens. But again, I want to see them participate in more of these qualifiers, maybe make it into the playoffs. And I think they have a lot of potential. Obviously, a lot of strong players on that team too. We talked a bit about Nagrom playing for them to uh, today, Virtual, Ixia. I mean, again, like you name it, they have players that have been around for a long, 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 long time. Junkrat finally makes an appearance. We get Junkrat into the game and we have Varian. Side note, I don't know if I mentioned it in this series, but I've been pretty much calling it out in every single match that we had in the Banshee Cup. You cannot play the same hero more than once in a series. That's the only draft rule for the tournament. So we are not going to use any pre-bans, neither for the qualifiers nor for the playoffs. This is going to be just normal drafts with that one exception that I just pointed out. Just simply because we don't want to see Hanzo in every single game. It's the only reason. The hero pool is big enough that particularly in best of threes, but also in best of fives, you will always be able to uh, draft proper comps, proper team compositions. But nobody wants to see the, the Hanzo show all day, every day. So, yeah. Jaina is uh, not played, but the other girl with the hoodie. Vala gets banned, which I don't like. I think this is disrespectful to me personally because I love Vala. So, yeah. Then again, we have Ixia with his white main. Yeah, Ixia has an interesting hero pool, by the way. And Genji gets banned too. Towers of Doom is always a bit of a different story. I would love for someone to just bust out the Vikings all of a sudden. Or go for Samoro again. But both of these teams are not really focusing on those too much. So, yeah, blue team with a quick double pick. And what are we getting from them? You want to have burst damage. If you're going for a variant taunt in an ideal world, you're looking for bursty damage. That normally, mean, normally means mage. Or you go for oh, Sonya with a little bit of a slap. Sonya could also go leap here again. Then you have a taunt into leap. Rona can jump in with Rhaegar. And Cesar Boss has been playing... Mephisto, Mediv. So if anybody is going to play a mage here, it's going to be him. A hero that we have actually not seen a whole lot in this tournament yet, I think she was banned once, twice, is Cassia. Cassia has not seen a lot of play. Here comes Deathwing. And we get Tassada. Okay. I like it. Tassada. Coming in right away. Plus our final pick for the final map in the first best of three of the day. 
Who are we getting? Come on, boys. You need a little bit more damage. If you want to follow up on stuns, on taunts, then uh, you need more than only Junkrat. Rip tire is nice. But that's a lot of a lot of ult cooldowns that you're talking. It's Chen. They're going Panda. Fat Illidan is in the house. We're going triple frontline. Towers of Doom, everybody. Game number three. The winner goes to the next round of the loser's bracket. The loser drops out of qualifying number two for the Banshee Cup. Let's go. Prepare yourself for battle. Raspidol on the left with Mark Kostel on Varian, Sesabos on Chen, Akunis on Sonia, Bronig on Rega, Balor on Junkrat. And over on the right side, the fan club, the Frenchies with Jean Lasalle on Deathwing. We get Malganir on Nuburak this time, Virtual on Urel, Ixia on Whitemane, and Nagrom is playing at Tacita. To the day, I still don't know if it's really Nagrom or just Morgan spelled backwards. I asked him. I have the feeling he doesn't know either. And what the hell? What? High King's Quest on Varian? Are we going to see Smash? Is he not going to go taunt here? With Sonya Leap as a follow-up. Oh. Okay, that is an interesting level one choice. Tassara is already dropping some walls. Here's the best walls. And, well, they're losing uh, Sonia. So, Sonia gone. And we say bye bye. She is eliminated. Instantly out. First blood right at the beginning of the game. But yeah, we're actually getting some interesting talents here. We have Stormcall on level one with Rega now starting to stack it up. Then at the same time, it's the High King's Quest. So, I am shocked and curious. Is probably the best way to descri describe it. I am currently very heavily questioning what's gonna <laughs> be happening here. So, yeah. What are we gonna get? Time will tell. For now, we have another kill. Ma no, oh, Markotzl gets saved. Good for him. That could have been disastrous, but yep, they are able to get that done, so good for them. Saving the target here for just a moment, Varian is still alive and kicking, and in the meantime, we have the camps up, so that means it is pumpkin time. Players are starting to make their moves for pumpkins, starting to uh, even invade the opponent's camp here, yes, they are starting to move over and try and get this one. So, uh, Tassada. A little bit in trouble. Not sure, not sure what that wall was supposed to accomplish, but okay, fair enough. Looked amazing. Good job. He's still alive, though. <laughs> they, they kill Rega. Nagrom is just sitting in the middle and is eating the damage. Gets healed up by White Man the entire time. Ixia is just popping off once again, and that leads them to two more kills. Tasha is not dying. He's just sitting there. And Ixia is right next to him. He's like, yeah, it's going to be fine. So, yeah, you're good, bro. You're good. Easy kills, and that is four kills to zero. <laughs> <laughs> and Baloa is in... Uh, yeah, well, he's dead too. So, that's all of a sudden five kills to nothing. Level four, an entire level lead. And, yeah, White Mane and her heal power is just a bit bonkers. She's just coming in. Ixia, a little sexy hexy over there, is doing work. And Tassada, just trusted. But you can't do it without White Mane, uh, Nagrom. I'm really sorry, but this time Bronik took him out. So Tassada gets bitten by a wolf and dies. Protoss are just plebs and always have been. Oh yeah. Only a dead Protoss is a good Protoss. Kill them all. All those A-movers, take them all out. Take them all out. Zerg is the real master race, as we all know. Oh, and that's another kill. Yeah, White Mane is gone. And we actually get Smash. Varian is going to yell a lot. It's all that pent up anger and frustration over having a spawn like Anduin that he is just starting to voice out. I mean, essentially what happened, Varian was really unhappy. He had a bit of a midlife crisis. Uh, his life was really going to shit. He found himself in Nexus at some point then too, and things were just not working out for him. And on uh, advice from one of his best friends, he started to take some uh, therapy. And they just told him, you need to voice your anger. You need to give it an out. There needs to be an outlet. You have to do something. That's how Smash was created. Because Varian at some point just came in and he just like screamed his pain out to the world. And he's like, 
Initially he was yelling, I hate Anduin, I hate my son, but they turned out it was a little bit too long, you know, it was not really a good catch face or anything. So at this point he's just yelling. And it's working really well, like people love it and it's just a bit of a key thing. But you're gonna hear it throughout the game right now whenever he makes a move. So yeah, once again, these are the stories that Blizzard is not gonna try and tell you. They're a little bit shamed, it was not quite what they initially had planned as character development, but that's just what happened. So Varian already... You see? Do you hear that? Rawr! Like all the pain. And he's better for it. He's better for it. He overcame that. And he sold the Ferrari again. Anyways. Lost half the audience there. Let's go. Cap is up. And that's a Deathwing. Dead and Varian dies to Deathwing dead. And we got Sonya plus Varian eliminated. The camp also taken at least by the blue team. So they might have lost some heroes. But they took the pumpkins away from them. They might still lose Chen. E yeah, okay. <laughs> it was close, but yeah, he survives. <laughs> but yeah, an interesting game. Interesting game, interesting talents. Eight kills to three. The gap has been closed to an extent, but it's still an advantage for the French team. On uh, level three, uh, four, seven. <laughs> let's just drop all the numbers, Calder. Let's let's just drop them all. One of them is going to be correct. On level seven, we get second wind. I was confused by it's 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 level seven, but it's second wind. Okay, so yeah, that that's that's all that happened there. And then I got irritated for a moment by that unfamiliar icon on level four that we normally don't get to see. So it's absolutely. Yeah, I'm not drinking. I swear to God, I am. I'm not drinking. It's too early in the day. Anyways, uh, level 10 kicking in soon. We have intercession also now ready, the psionic echo. Again, Junkrat in uh, some trouble. Varian is yelling as usual, and Deathwing is also making uh, an ex appearance. They still have Fat Illidan in the back line, and for Virtual, it's actually kind of lucky that he got stunned out. If Chen makes a big move for Urel, that could potentially be a kill. He definitely had a chance there. But level 10 is now kicking in any moment for the fan club. And, well, here we go. Channel is starting. We have seen two already channeled through by the French team, by the team in red. And now that they have level 10, it's a tiny window, but that's still more than enough to try and go for a kill here. Cocoon got to be thrown out if they want to. They go for Rega, okay. And where's that ult? There it is. Oh yeah, baby. Give me that black hole. But not too much. They zoned them out from the altar. That's all that they needed to do here. And with that, we now have them uh, locking in another another altar. Another four shots. So, yeah. Great for them. Great job. All the way towards the top. What we have in the meantime is a quick attack coming in for uh, the minion waves. Get some experience. Try and stay ahead of the blue team. Blue team also initially, like, it's kind of funny. So if you're looking at the tournament bracket, the way that it's normally arranged in any game, and I've been talking about this a bit in the past, the team that's at the top of a pairing is always starting left. And the team that's on uh, the bottom of a pairing is always starting right. And the Polish team came in, and these guys have been playing in tons of tournaments. And they immediately, they hosted, so they find themselves initially on the left, right, as a blue team. But they actually put themselves over towards the right side. And I actually think that they were trying to line the uh, their national colors up with their side. So they wanted to be the team on the red, which makes perfect sense. Polish team, the Russian team, <laughs> there's a couple of teams that definitely want to be on the right. I guess the Frenchies would love to be on the left. Ali le bleu! And, well, that's a kill, could be. They're trying to isolate white man, and nah. The top kick players are in the house, but they're not strong enough yet. They're going again for Sonya for Akunis. <laughs> it's, it's a big fight that we have here. Everybody is starting to go ham on this one. But who's gonna die? It seems like Sonya, the Ancestral, in time. Nice. And can they get Deathwing killed again? Deadwing, the Varian? I am not a fan of Smash, I gotta say it again. Like, why on God's green earth are you not going for a taunt with a leap follow-up? I just don't get it. Do you really feel like you need the damage there with Chen in, with Junkrat? I don't think so. Smash as an ult is just a meme. I think this would be so much easier for them. They had multiple chances now to go for an isolated target and he just doesn't do enough damage with this. Now, if this is going to change at some point, we'll see. But right now, I am not impressed. Not even a little bit. 
So 24 points on the blue team's core. They're attempting to get at least one alt out of it. And since everybody is rather low on the red side, they are going to fall back and allow Junkrat to channel this tool. Good, I, good moves here also being made to just zone them away from the altar. The channel has not happened though. They interrupted it. Got actually cancelled. Yeah, Varian is yelling again. He has nothing against Deathwing. Deathwing is just looking at this. He's just laughing. He's just like, yeah, stop it. That tickles. So stop it. No, don't. Please don't. It tickles. <laughs> yeah, that's, that smash has nothing on him. Shots are fired. A bit of, and we have them on 32 points on the core now. All right. So, now that we're going for the next camp, there's another chance to start taking those uh, away. Virtual, all right, careful. And yeah, there's a kill addict here, maybe. Finally, they kick White Fane down. Rega jumps away, Ancestrals himself. He lives, the dog that lived. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Someone called Peter. That is animal abuse. We can't have that. It looked so good. And then he just died. <laughs> Fantastic. I came in and dropped him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Unlucky. But okay. Rega died. He tried his best. He was a good doggy. But yeah, wasn't enough. He had four kills to ten. And right now... With level 13 talents on uh, for both teams, we have also that Earth Shield. Lightning Shield build has been heavily emphasized by Rega in uh, this particular game. We're looking at a Fire and Fury from uh, Deathwing. And on top, Repentance and the Shadow Arc. So, can the blue team turn this around? I mean, again, Towers of Doom is always a late game map, so it's a map where you really want to have all that momentum in the later stages. You can win a couple of team fights there. You're normally in a very good position because map control is everything. But here comes Chen. They try to go for Tassada. I mean, nicely done also with from X here. So they're able to save that, but Malganir goes down. Scarlet Aegis is getting dropped. Malganir is already gone. Bye-bye Anubarak. Now they're trying to go for Deathwing and turn him into Deadwing. But he is uh, easily walking out of that. Still a 5 versus 4. Still an advantage for Rospidol. At least for now. So can they go for a Bell Tower conversion? Or at least start to get it a bit lower in hit points. That's the bigger question right now. I'm not currently trying to pull that one off. But yeah, Varian yelling around a little bit. And just to put this in perspective, Varian is at 25,000 damage, okay? Chen is at 28,000. So, yeah. Sonya, she's been more playing PvE on the top lane. But yeah, Varian's damage, I think they could really have done more with Taunt. Hiking's quest though, I mean, we'll see what they can do in the long run. For now, it's just Sonya up at the top, smashing away, doing work, doing damage, trying to ensure that they are getting that bell tower eventually. Deathwing is of course doing whatever he can to try and prevent that from happening, to stop it. But with every single play that Sonya makes for it, the uh, hit points on uh, the keep are dropping a bit lower. Same time with 16. There's a small window that they could try and use again. We got White Mane now with a harsh discipline. And she's lashing out. And the Thermal Lance for Tassadar. And Nagrom is really making uh, a good case for Tassadar here. Oh yes, this is another kill. <laughs> Chakrat. <laughs> Line him up, baby. Nicely done. Nagrom now trying to play in here. And yep, there it is. The ult. The black hole. And zzz, brrr, laser him into the ground. Tassadar is getting mad value for them. It's honestly ridiculous. Leap saving Sonya as she jumps out. But, yeah, obviously not quite uh Oh, is he going to get that? Yeah, they, he is. Damn, that is 16 points on the core. And with another four shots fired, they're going to be down to 12. Not too bad. Down to eight. Single digits, baby. They got all three. Oh, yeah, someone is in trouble. Look at the damage output of Tassadar, by the way. Deathwing is 57,000. Tassadar is even surpassing him with the 65k. He's also top damage on Siege. Not only on the team, in the game. So, Tassadar is crushing it. Nagrom. Good stuff. 
Mm -hmm. And yeah, if they get the bell tower conversion at the bottom of the map, blue team is already in single digits. If you get another altar and then you move in, take the boss after a team fight, you can end the game. You can end the series right there. So off we go again. Varian screams his pain to the world right now. The most, uh, most of the pain is probably him. Uh, oh no! Junkrat! No! He is dead again. Four times that he's fallen and boy oh boy are they in trouble. Down to single digits on the core. We only have four heroes on the map and they might lose even more here. Ancestral to save the day for Chen, but at the bot lane, the bell tower gets taken out. The only good news is that at the top, Sonya is going to do the same thing here. She's going to get the top bell tower, but they're still fighting with the numbers disadvantage at the bottom of the map. Varian is dead. Fifth time that he died. Deathwing survives. And yeah, it's rough. They're losing too much. Rega is gone, gets just bursted down by Tacita. It's ridiculous what Narkrom is starting to stack up in uh, numbers here. I mean, look at this. Another one has to try and keck out two and barely makes it. But there's a single altar coming up and we have two heroes dead for Uros Piedol. So, yep, the French team, ladies and gentlemen, they drop them. French team with a the victory. They move on to the next round of the tournament. Always assuming they get the boss that they're working on. And kick Rospidol out of qualifier number two. With two heroes missing, there should be no chance for this boss to not be taken. But they actually are going for it. They're trying to get a kill instead. They will, I guess, get the kill here. Chen is going to fall. <laughs> it's going to take a while, but still. So now it's again a five versus four. They're just taking him down one after another. And Sonya leaps away, tries to get the kill on Urel, but they still haven't gotten that boss. And now they lose Deathwing, and Hiking's quest is completed. I, I think they should have just gone for, uh, for the boss here. I don't think there was a problem in grabbing that in a 5 versus 3. One hero might have come back, but it still gives them a numbers advantage. Right now, it's a 4 versus 4. Things have changed a little bit. Maybe they can hold this for now. After all, can the blue team somehow survive this with only four points on the core? They can't get another kill, so that's a problem. And yeah, level 20, any moment also for the red team. Another issue that they have to deal with. Urel is attempting to retake the bell tower at the top. A couple of pumpkins are going to be taken. Seraphim is now in. The Trader King. We got the Scarlet Crusade and also Arrival of a God. But with the double altar being up and even the boss being attacked. I guess they're going to get the boss. But there's also pumpkins now at the bottom of the map. So this is going to be insanely interesting. Without that level... <laughs> they don't have 20. It's like against level 20 talents. Yeah. Leap on an Uberak. They want Malganir. They drop some ults. Hoping to get a quick kill but it's not happening and now they have more of their main abilities on cooldown and have to somehow try and fight into that altar which is always annoying even at the best of times there's already the wall they're trying to trap chen rega is cocooned the damage is coming and can they go for rega well they're trying and they got the black hole out once again those walls are up rega is down chen is dead so is varian Deathwing died, but who cares? They murder Sonya, and the only survivor is Junkrat. This is game. The channel is happening as we speak, and Ixia is finishing the tournament run of the Polish team as he drops it. Well done. Bobby Kotisch fan club moves on to the next round of the loser's bracket. GG.